How y'all doing? Donald here today, and we're going to talk about uh, G O R M, or as I like to pronounce it because of the way it's spelled, GORM. Uh, GORM is a uh, O R M, specifically a code first O R M, meaning what the purpose of this is, is that we're going to be writing Go code that allows us to both create our database schema as well as interact with the database without actually writing SQL queries. Now here's the documentation for it. Um, and there's just kind of a general overview of what you do with it. Um, that you can, it supports you know, associations, uh, so like foreign keys and stuff like that. Um, you can run hooks when you do certain things like creating, saving, updating data, um, eager loading, transactions, you know, mo most things you'd want to do with uh, SQL databases. Um, so I have wrote some code and we're going to, uh, instead of me like writing it and then like talking about it, I'm just going to go over what's happening and we're going to run it and see what happens. Okay. So let me go over to my code. So right off the bat, we have some types defined. Okay. And you'll notice there's, there's a, there's something embedded here. It says go gorm .model. And if we want to look at what that is, if we go to declaring models, I think it's declaring models, or maybe it's uh, conventions. Yeah, okay. So, gorm.model is a just a basic struct that has some um, basic fields that are very common to be ha to that are used in SQL databases, uh, notably ID, which is used as a primary key, uh, created at date, updated date, and a deleted at date. And uh, you kind of read through it, it says, uh, Gorm uses any field with the name ID as the table's primary key by default. So instead of like embedding the Gorm.model struct, in case you didn't want like the, all the date related fields there, um, if you just literally have a, a, a property on your struct called ID, it's going to assume this is what you meant as the primary key. Uh, Gorm has, and you'll see this in a lot of places in documentation, a lot of places where you can kind of change the default behavior using tags on your struct. So for example, this is not called ID, so this would not, Gorm would not assume this is the primary key, but you can tell it through this tag, this Gorm colon primary key that, hey, whenever you're generating the schema for this, this is, this is the primary key for it. Um, so if we go back, so what this actually has in it is ID, created at, updated at, deleted at, and then name and description. And I have three structs here. Um, they kind of mimic like a very basic like chat system. There's channel, and then there's users, and then there's messages. And then the messages, uh, besides just having the actual message, have a reference to the channel it's in and the user who wrote it. So if we go to user, we have, again, the GORM model, uh, the email, the user, and the username. And then the message just has the content, uh, user ID, channel ID, user and channel. Now I'll explain why this looks duplicated. And this is the only way I could figure out to get this to work so far, is if we go to associations, what we have here is that these messages belong to both user and channel. And if we go to the documentation about belongs to, it shows an example of how to do this. So it, it has a user, not dissimilar from the one that we have. And then it has a profile, which in my case would be a message. And in order to associate this properly, you, you say it has a user property here and also a user ID. And that's because if you'll see, when it's talking about foreign key relationships with this, it says to define a belongs to relationship, the foreign key must exist, and the default foreign key uses the owner's type name plus its primary key. So in the case of um, our user struct, because it's the one that owns the message, the primary key, or the, the, yeah, the foreign key would have to be user, because it's the name of the struct, and then the primary key is called ID, so it'd be ID. Uh, again, you can overwrite that with tags to say, like in this example, the foreign key for the user in the case of destruct is this other field called user refer. 
and uh, way you work with this. And for some reason, whenever I've been trying this on my own, uh, this does not populate the user struct defin like the actual like user struct information on your on the message. I'm not real sure why I could have just done something wrong, but we'll we'll get to that in a minute. So um, I have a couple functions defined here. If we go through, um, one is setup, and you'll see I'm passing in a pointer to this gorm.db, and we'll see why that why that is in a minute. And you'll see I'm running this thing called auto migrate. If we go to the documentation section about doc about uh, where is it? Uh, gotta find it again. Declaring models. I guess that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for migration. That's what I'm looking for. So the, the 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 big thing here is the auto migration tool, and you will see that it will automatically keep your schema up to date. However, keep this in mind, it will only create tables, missing columns, and missing indexes. It will not remove unused columns, tables, or indexes. Uh, it does that in order so that you don't accidentally delete your own data, essentially. Uh, now, you'll see here in the schema methods, and I don't really make use of these, but it's, it's interesting, but it's, it's good to keep this in mind. It provides a number of ways to look at your actual database schema to learn more information about it. You can check if it has a table, either by giving the explicit name or passing in basically a blank instance of that struct so that can infer all the information about it like it does normally. You can drop tables, modify columns, drop columns, add indexes, you know, e everything you would normally want to do with a schema. Uh, so if we go back over here, you will see that I am passing in a basically a blank pointer to channel user message. So what this is going to do is going to uh, create three tables in our database. Uh, one called channel, one called user, one, one called messages. And it's going to have the fields that these structs have, okay? And then I have a seed met function here to just kind of add some temper, just some like junk data here. So we're putting in our channels and you're gonna see how you do that. Uh, I didn't find an easier way to do this in documentation. Technically the easier way to do this would be you do like a prepared statement or maybe even just do transactions, which it does support. Uh, but just to get this working, I just looped over the slice and just called create. Uh, what this will do is it'll look at your struct and generate a SQL query to insert a row into this table with that struct's information. Um, same thing with users and same thing with uh, messages. But you'll notice before I did the message, we actually have a few instances of trying to grab information out of our database. You'll see I'm calling a method here called first. And what first will do is you, you have to pass in the um, a pointer to the variable you want to unmarshal the result into. And it looks at the type of the variable that you're want to, uh, wanting to unmarshal the data into to determine what table you're trying to query. So you'll notice that I these just general chat and suggestions chat um, variables are channel types. So it's going to go, okay, you're wanting to query from the channels table. And then there's a couple different ways where you can add like where clauses. And one of them is you can do like an inline, which is what I've done here. And what it's doing is it's going to kind of uh, insert this where clause into the generated SQL query. Uh, there's a, a number of different ways to do this. Uh, you can look at the documentation and there, uh, and there's again, there's, there's all kinds of ways to add some clauses to your SQL queries. And it's going to specifically looking for the channel with the name of general. And I have turned on the like verbose logging for this. So what we're going to do is I'm going to run this towards the end. And we're going to look at all of the air, all of the logging messages to see exactly what it's doing. Okay? And you'll see that I am uh, creating these messages. And you'll notice that for something like channel and user, I've actually given it the structs. So what it's going to do is it's actually going to see if this struct exists in the database. And if it doesn't, by default, it'll actually create it as well. 
uh, to keep everything in sync. Uh, but if it does, it's actually going to pluck the ID off of it and insert that into that foreign key field, which in our case is channel ID and user ID. And I just create them. And then we get to the, the main bulk of our, like our main function. So here we're going to be opening a database connection. Uh, this, if you've used the, the, like the generic SQL interface, this looks very similar. Uh, I'm just using SQLite here, so I don't gotta fudge with, you know, MySQL or Postgres server or something. Uh, obviously, depending on which type of database you're connecting to, these credentials will be different. In the case of SQLite, it's just a path to the file. Uh, in the case of something like MySQL, it would be like the full URL with the credentials and everything. I'm um, just error checking to make sure that, you know, the connection didn't Bork, which I don't, I don't know if you can, that, that can Bork in SQLite. Uh, we're deferring a close call to make sure that the connection's closed and we're done. And here I'm turning the log mode on true. So if we look at the documentation and go to uh, logger, you will see that it has like a, 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 a built-in way to kind of like have like a verbose uh, logging going on. And you can just turn it off or on. And you can also specifically do it on single operations. So like if there's a specific query where you're wanting to see what's happening, you can call this debug method and then chain on. Uh, Gorm makes very heavy use of method chaining. Uh, there's, there's even a whole section here about method chaining that uh, I'll go over at the very end. And uh, I'm calling setup to do all my migrations. Uh, which in turn calls seed to do all the, the data seeding. And then just uh, it gives another example of trying to pull data from the database. I'm just going to say, I'm going to call this function call, this method called find. And it's going to look at the type of variable again. And it's going to look at, oh, this is a slice of user. So it's just going to, and there's no where clause. So it's just going to grab all of the users out of our users table and just unmarshal them into our, our user slice. And then I'm just printing them out to uh, show you that it's actually pulling the data. And then for the message one, I wanted to, this is where I said it wasn't really like populating the actual user struct information that's on the, the messages. I wasn't sure why. Again, I could have been doing something wrong. So um, if we go to the documentation again real fast and go to belongs to, down at the bottom here, it says, if I want to find every, in this case, profile that belongs to this user, you would say model and then the, the pointer to your variable and then uh, a pointer related and then a pointer to the thing that you want to uh, unmarshal the result into. In our case, um, I am passing in the first user that we found. So it would it'd be like a user with ID of one. And then I'm saying related on messages. And you'll see that the query you get that is generated basically kind of inserts a where clause um, onto a select on the message table that uh, has in it a, a clause that says like a where user ID equals and then the ID of the struct that I passed in. And then we're just doing it over that. And then I have another example here where we're going to look at how you do error handling with GORM because it's, it's different than the idiomatic way that you do Go. So let me get rid of my SQL Lite database file here. And we're gonna run this and we're gonna go over the log step by step, okay? To see exactly what's happening. So burp, you're gonna see a big vomit of stuff. Now we can ignore the first part of this because pretty much every single SQL Lite driver that I know for Go actually makes use, has to use CGO. So these are just like warnings from like the, the C bindings from the actual like C library. So if you're doing like MySQL or Postgres, you won't see this stuff most likely. So if remember the first thing we were doing was doing the migrations and you'll see we have our queries being generated to create the channels table. And you will see that it has that uh, ID primary key auto incrementing the created at date time, updated at date time, and deleted at date time. These all came from our gorm.model uh, embedded struct. And then we actually have the two 
uh, two properties that the struct actually had, which is name and description. And you'll notice that by default, those have been interpreted as just being varchar, at least in the case of SQLite. Um, and then you'll notice that it created a uh, index on deleted that. So I think the way that works by default is if your struct has a deleted at property, it switches to using soft delete. And I think there's a whole section about that up here in delete. Uh, yeah, soft delete. If a model has a deleted at field, it will get a soft delete ability automatically. So when you call delete, rather than actually deleting it out of the database, it's just going to set the deleted at value to be whatever the current timestamp is. So this is a uh, delete record. Yeah, okay. Uh, if, if you're wanting to like explicitly delete something that has a deleted at, this is just the way you kind of like overwrite it. But uh, it's not uncommon to want to keep data even though it's quote deleted and that's why by default it has this soft delete functionality built into it is something to keep and uh that's why there's an index on this because by default if you has a delete of that it basically does like a lot of a lot of your queries will automatically have a where clause injected into it that says like where deleted at is null or something like that and we'll create our user table and our message table and again you will see our user id and channel id and there's our index and this is where we are inserting our channels and you'll see it on i think it was three channels and you're going to see three separate insert into statements and you'll see the values are and this is the um where is it the, uh uh this automatically generated the timestamp i think for created that and updated that yeah, created that, updated that, and then deleted that as null because we're not deleting it. And then our channel name and channel description. Same thing for the other two. Uh, then users looks fine. You know, there's there's the email username, and then channels. Now you will see you will see I'm grabbing the channels right because if we go back up to this part and go to where I was grabbing channels. So you'll see that because I did this inline where statement here, basically, you will see the query has been adjusted to be select uh, star from channels where channels dot delete that is null. Like I said, it kind of inserts that if, they're, if it's doing that soft delete thing and name equals general which is what our uh little placeholder uh statement here was and you'll notice it's it's limiting to one reason it's limiting to one is because i use the first method the first method will just says literally says hey run this query give me the first result uh, if you wanted the all of them you would just run find and it would just give you every single result if you wanted the last one there's a last method uh, there's a couple, so there's a couple convenience methods like that. Uh, I think um, if we go look at queries, and this also will show you the different ways to do um, where's. So plain SQL is what I used, uh, but there's also, you can do it by passing in structs and maps. And uh, where is it? Yeah, this was a, this is the inline condition that I did. And if you go up to query, you'll see, you see first, and then there's take, uh, get one record, no specific order. First actually does it by primary key. That's right, excuse me. Gives you the first record specifically by the primary key. Uh, take doesn't care what the which one it gives you. Uh, yeah, and when you're doing first, you can explicitly do something like, give me the first record, and I'm looking for something with the primary key of 10. Note this only works on integer primary keys uh, and I'm getting the second channel and here's where the I'm grabbing the users again I'm using that inline raw SQL query and then you'll see there's an update users I'm actually not really sure why it doesn't update there that's a little weird okay uh, maybe it's because of the auto update that's a little weird I don't know why I would do that anyway but then you'll see insert into messages. Uh, 
the date stuff, content, user ID, channel ID. Here's the message and here's the IDs of the user and the channel. Okay. And we're going to go to, uh, I think this is where I was. Okay. Yeah. So now we're back down and I said, give me all users. And we have select star from users where users is deleted. That is null. And we see we have both our users. Here's, here's Joe and here's Bob that may have the correct data. And for the messages, I specifically said, give me all the messages that belong to the first user. And the first user has an idea of one. And you will see that we have select star from messages where messages deleted as null and user ID is one. So this is like a, a quick way to say, if you have a table that belongs relationship wise to another table, you can just use this and basically say, hey, give me every single one of these period. Uh, I think you can actually, you could probably do method chaining to say like, give me the first one, give me the second one, things like that. Or yeah, give me the last one. And now we get to, and I'm printing out that information, sorry. and. Then we get to the error handling part, which is a little weird. Uh, again, it doesn't do it the way that Go normally does it. Uh, if you run a query and there was an error, it stores it in like this this variable here. I'm assuming it's a variable. Maybe it's a yeah, I think it's a variable uh, called error. So after you run a query, if there was an error, it'll actually return an error. Okay, and uh, if we're gonna check and see, okay. I ran this query where I specifically looked for a user that didn't exist. And I'm checking if error is not nil. Hey, there was an error, throw a fatal message, throw a fatal message. And you'll see down here where it tried to look for a user with the username of Fred, wasn't one. So it threw an error and you'll see that the error says, error when loading user, record not found. Uh, that is technically uh, an error. Maybe that, some people that sounds a little weird, but finding no records in the, in the case of uh, handling with SQL and Go it does count as an error. Actually, because there's even a SQL error in the generic SQL package, I think called SQL, no, or SQL error no rows, which basically means I didn't find anything. Uh, yeah, so that's a basic overview of how you can uh, automatically create your schema with your struct, struct definitions. Uh, insert data into those tables and pull data back out of those tables and as well as you get to actually see what's going on behind the scenes and also the error handling because i figured the error handling was worth highlighting because it's a little weird compared to normal go idioms if you uh if you want to get in more into what you can do with this there's like i said there's all kinds of things there's for updating um this is actually fairly simple you would just pull it out of the database, uh, change the field properties, and then just call db.save and pass it in the reference. And it'll just, as you'll see, automatically generate an update query for it. Uh, there's all kinds of associations, um, the hooks, transactions, uh, composite primary keys. Um, here's what databases it actually supports. SQLite, MySQL, Postgres, and uh, Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, there are any caveats with these are mentioned here uh, such as i think with uh, mysql you have to connect with a specific option to make sure that it's using um something to do with timestamps i forget what it was exactly anyway i'm rambling now uh that's all i got for y'all today stick around for the next time and we're going to be looking at a different orm which is uh a schema first ORM, meaning you use the schema to generate the code, not the other way around. Uh, so look out for that one. And uh, with that, I am done. Y'all come on back now and I'll see you next time.